Welcome everybody. We're back here live at MetaFuture. My name is Kate Warnock. I'm the social media manager for Guidewell. With us right now in the Guidewell Insights Lounge, we have Glenn Tolman, CEO and Chair of Livongo, excuse me, uh, Livongo Health. Sorry, I fell over that. That's okay. Welcome to, to our, our interview, Glenn. We're happy to have you. Happy to be here. Well, Glenn, you know, you have a very long and distinguished career in the, in the data fields in particular. I'm wondering, um, especially with Livongo Health, how do you see big data being leveraged to truly impact population health? Well, I think we're at uh, a real transitional point in healthcare today. And for the first time, we have the systems, the foundation in place to really begin to use big data. So traditionally, even electronic health records where I spent a good part of my career, mm -hmm. those were data gathering mm -hmm. uh, and data repository kinds of systems. Um, but they haven't yet turned into real-time information systems. And so now the ability to go from a system that's in front of a physician or even in front of a health consumer, go to the cloud, and real-time return information that allows them to improve their health is something that we've never seen before. And right. I think it's going to fundamentally change healthcare. Right. Well, you know, you were suggesting in an article that you wrote recently on for, in for, uh that we need kind of an, an Uber to happen in the healthcare industry. So the, I think the challenge is, you know, the healthcare industry, as you know certainly very well, is so highly regulated. How do we bring about that kind of disruption, very consumer-facing, fa like an Uber, yet get through all the red tape sure. that, that the healthcare industry is regulated by? Well, I think that what you're seeing today is you are seeing the consumerization of healthcare, I think, with um, the Accountable Care Act, you know, Obamacare, whatever people want to say about it, it is driving the consumerization of healthcare. And so we're seeing people start to get the navigation tools that they need. We're equipping people with dollars to go out and buy services, which they've never done before. Mm -hmm. And so as they learn to do that, it's going to be much more like Uber, which is you're going to have a mobile device, a telephone. You're going to be able to say, talk to me, and you'll be instantly talking to a physician or a nurse or a care uh, navigator. You can say, schedule me, and they'll schedule you. And finally, you can go through and get information that's real time. You know, in today's environment, you can go out and you can go on WebMD or you can go on Google, and you can get information that in the past was never available to normal people like us, to right. health consumers. And I think that whole idea of moving from patients, which when you think about patients, you're talking about after the fact to a preventive value-based model where we're talking about health consumers, that's a different change and it's so transformational that it will have an, a ripple effect throughout the whole system. So this is a very different time. Well, I think that's a great lead into our next question. Obviously, consumerism is such a focus at MetaFuture. It really is about putting the emphasis on the individual. Yet in another role that you've been in, um, you helped to transform a company that had been doing uh, not so well, and, and you rebirthed it basically mm -hmm. to be a phenomenally successful enterprise. How is it that you win the hearts and minds of the people that work for you to produce the kind of output that you would like to have from them? How do you make them be a consumer sure. within their own company? Well, I think the first thing you have to start with is vision, and that is what are you trying to accomplish? And in healthcare, we have this great advantage, and that is people who work in healthcare generally want to help other people and they want to make a difference. And if you can get people to buy into the vision and the mission, what are you trying to accomplish? At that point, the rest really becomes easy. Then you have to treat each person as an owner, and you have to give them stock in the company. And when I say that, I mean it's, it's beyond just giving them stock as we hear of today, but it's really giving them an ownership piece of the company so they know what they have accomplished, how they're successful, and the like. So the clearer you can make the goals, knowing that those goals are important. You know, when we look at investments now, and everything we do is about how do we make a difference, mm -hmm. how do we do that at scale, and how do we create a great company that we'd be proud to work for. And if that's the approach, it's amazing the kind of people that gravitate to you. And then you just have to take great care of them, which means really staying out of their way in most cases. <laughs> right, right. Well, I think that your background too, I wonder, 
it, you're obviously a tremendous leader. Um, you know, you have both the, the skill sets for the, for the industry side, you have the people skill sets as well. And I'm wondering, you know, I see from your background that you have an advanced degree in anthropology from Oxford. You've always been fascinated by people. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, you know, do you think that in today's environment, which is putting much more of an emphasis on students going into STEM careers, you know, science, technology, engineering, sure. and math, is it still worth pursuing a liberal arts education so that you do have a really well-rounded workforce? Well, it's a great question. It's a challenging question. I think first we have to start with the basics. Whatever you do, we have to improve our education system. And that starts from K through 12 and then moves into college and then moves into advanced degrees. So one, we have to step up our game there. And a big part of the way to do that is to use technology again, which is there's no reason in today's environment to have a professor stand in front of a classroom and repeat the same lecture four times a week as happens in many of our top universities today. That's just not necessary. Those professors ought to be used to engage the students. And the mm -hmm. students aren't going to sit there and watch it. Mm -hmm. They're used to social media. They're mm -hmm. used to an interactive kind of environment. So one, we have to first and foremost change the learning environment. Then the second thing we have to do is make sure that we balance STEM, which is unbelievably important. And everybody, including liberal arts people, ought to have some element of STEM in their education. Everybody ought to understand how computers work, how networks work, what the scaling effects are and the like. Um, but then we ought to pair that with the, um, the arts and the liberal arts in particular. So I'm a, I'm a graduate of a liberal arts organization. I'm a big believer in the liberal arts, but I don't think you get a pass on saying because you're in the liberal arts, um, that means you don't do very tough work, uh, very right. challenging work. And I also think that you know, we ought to promote more than ever before uh, the sciences and engineering and the like, because those are going to be critically important. You can't have one without the other. And I think thinking we can do one without the other can't do that. I also think in healthcare in particular, what we're seeing now is physicians who are also business people. They're going back and getting MBAs. Right. And we're seeing the crossover. We're seeing artists who are using the latest technology to create new kinds of impacts. So I think it's all about a blending, but we've got to step up the investment in education. And that's ongoing education for all of us. Right, right. Well, I love that, that ending note on, on education because I think obviously what we've seen here at MetaFuture, all of our attendees have a diverse background, but they bring to the table their passion, their insights into what can happen in the future, and really putting the people at the core of that solution. You know, I think the more well-rounded we have as a student population, the more innovation we're going to see in the future. So, I agree. All right. I agree. Well, Glenn, I can't tell you thank you so much for being well, um, thank you. In, in the Guidewell Insights Lounge with us today. My name is Kate Warnock. We'll be back again with you soon.